Hello, my name is Carol Vashigazek Tafumane. Welcome to Addicted, a show where we discuss about substance abuse and the road to recovery. On today's show, we've got Munya Chidzonga. Welcome, Munya. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for having me. Uh, we really appreciate you having accepted to be here to discuss our issue uh, of the day. Uh, so tell me a bit about yourself. Wow, um, where do I begin? Uh, Carol, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a filmmaker, an award-winning actor, and I'm a husband and a father. Wow, lovely. You've just started off from like five years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, tell me about, a bit about um, when you were young. I understand you started acting when you were like six, when you became a king in one of the plays, yeah. Yes. Wow, okay, you, hey, you went right back, to the, right back to the beginning. Yeah, you know, the first, my first uh, introduction to acting was when I was about six years old and I played a king in a play called The Princess and the Pea, uh, where um, basically the story is that th there's a, a little pea that's put a, un underneath a lot of mattresses, because the theory was if this woman is a princess, she'll be able to feel any discomfort. Um, so they put a lot of these mattresses on, on, on a bed and they put a little pea underneath it, and the princess felt it and they realized she was a princess. I played the father, the king. Um, so that was when it all started. Um, and then from there, um, when I was in junior school, I, I remember we were in a reading class and I was reading out and I was cast in my first play I think when I was grade six. You know, I, I was always in the choir and always singing and stuff. So I was cast in this play and at the end of it, I won the drama award. Wow. So I, I think, you know, I started to see that, okay, maybe I should be performing. And, you know, my, my, my aunt, my mining, um, she always used to push me to perform and anytime we'd have family gatherings they would make me sing solos and so I, 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 I sort of grew up performing. Wow that's so interesting. My daughter went to Peter House that you also went to Peter House and not only that but you actually were the first student at Peter House to get the colors for drama. Yes ma'am that was yeah. <laughs> wow that's that's something. Yeah that was so you know it's actually and it, it was it was strange so I only managed to get half colors but it was still, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll take yeah. it, I'll take it. Um, and if you, if you ask your daughter about half colors and full, cause you get half colors and then full colors. But it was, I didn't actually know that I was the first one until there was a teacher there who was, was quite old. I think he had been there for about 30, 30 to 40 years. And he told me that his son was there in the eighties and he used to love acting. And I think his son was now um, a lawyer. And he was like, this guy should have been given the award and they didn't have it then. So I'm really happy that you got it. So I was, I was a bit blown away by that. And I remember at the time um, begging my father that, look, dad, can we donate a trophy, uh, the drama award to the school, mm -hmm. you know, in commemoration of this, so that other kids who love drama, yes. you know, and um, ah, he said, I don't know, we don't know about these things. We don't do these things. And, you know, he's a different generation. Funny enough, now um, my my you know my son. We want my son to go there, and we went back to the school with him. And he said, "You know, what, do you remember that trophy?" And I was like, "What do you mean?" And then I remembered. I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I remember." And he's like, "You know, what, we should have done it." I didn't understand what you meant at the time. Yeah. But now I get it. You know. Um, so I'm sure I must have seemed crazy to my parents <laughs> and wow. to a lot of other people. Wow. But yeah. Well, I think uh, Munya is one uh, guy that has really been doing great in his field and you can tell from the young age that he's just a born actor. So anyway, let's talk about Big Brother. <laughs> you went on Big Brother Africa and um, you came third. And we're, I'm telling you, I was one of those people who were like, Zimbabwe, go Zimbabwe. How did you feel coming third on that show? I'm serious, me. I'm serious, me. I'm serious, me. I've never seen that shit before. What do you want me to do? That's hey! No, what? Wait. Get a bucket. Eat. Get a bucket or something. A bucket. Yeah. Cameras. Hello. I want to be in the bathroom scrub and disinfect. Ah, that's disgusting. Now pee on myself. Ah, hey, no, hey, no. You use a bucket because everyone else uses that, bro. Well, so, even people pee when they are showering. Fuck. What's your problem? Oh, what's what's your Yes. You're talking about people peeing when they shower. I see two people do that. Did you hear us complaining the other time? No, I didn't. Ah. So the so I so I. I I did it twice. Uh, the first time I came third, and then the second time I came second. So it was, wow. a, it was an improvement. Yeah. Someone was actually yeah. saying, if I go in one more time, I should win this time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I think you should try going on again. <laughs> Hectic. We'll leave it to more qualified people. Um, it, it was, look, it was a life-changing experience. And I mean, sometimes it's hard to 
to admit that, I mean, this, this was almost 10, 12 years ago that I came out, or I went in and I came out for the second time. And, but I still remember the experience. I still remember what it felt like. It, it was life changing, you know. It was one of those things where, you know, you get to examine yourself. You, you, you know, you, when you're put in a situation like that, you're forced to examine who you are, and you're fa you're forced to face your own character, your own your own demons, your own shortcomings, but also your own strengths. You know, you start to realize how strong you are and how good you are at certain things, but it's life changing. And it's actually, if, if possible, if it were possible, I'd recommend it to everyone. It's such a great experience. Um, yeah, you learn a lot. <laughs> wow. Okay, so now you've um, grown and you've gone through Big Brother and you're now famous. Everybody knows about Munya. I remember you've made the president. <laughs> Wonderful. So how did that change you in terms of character? Uh, we here mainly talking about drug and alcohol abuse. Um, do, do you think being that popular, being that famous, probably led you into drinking or into taking drugs? It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> you know, I always say to people that, you know, fame is a sarcophagus if you don't use it properly. A sarcophagus, big coffin, you know. And if you don't understand, if you don't have the tools to deal with that kind of attention, you can definitely go astray. However, it can also be a blessing and a springboard, and it does open up so many doors. Um, it's, a, it's a gift, it's a blessing, you know, because there's some people who go through their entire lives, and the only people who ever know who they are are their children and their wives, and then they pass away, and they have never have a, a significant impact. But it's such a gift and such a blessing for a complete stranger to recognize you and to smile when they hear your name and they say, ah, Munya, Munya, Dave, you know? And that's a blessing, that's a gift. Um, in terms of the drugs and, um, and the alcohol side of it, look, everything has a good side and a bad side, you know? Um, for, for, for you to have light, you must have dark. For you to have dark, you must have light, you know? And light is the opposite of dark and, and, and vice versa. So. There's a very good side of being famous. You know, you can achieve a lot, but there's also a lot of a, a huge dark side. You, there's a lot of pressure, and there's a lot of expectation, and that expectation is crushing. You know, there's nothing worse than, you know, when you walk into a room and you know you feel that there's an expectation of you, and you don't know how to handle it, yeah. especially if you don't have the tools. You can turn to things like drugs because it's painful. So you turn to things that numb that pain of you know, um, expectation, the pain of um, sometimes disappointment when things don't turn out. Because when you're that famous, you expect things to happen a certain way because people expect it of you. So if I drive, if I'm driving a car, right, and that's the car that I can afford, because I'm famous, people will be like, mm, I'm up. Mm. that's not the car you should be driving. People are putting their expectations on me and I have to live up to that. That's a lot of pressure. So, but, to answer the question about whether that led to addiction, I was an addict before I became famous. I just didn't know it. So when I became famous, it just made everything worse because now I had access to alcohol, access to drugs. You know, people, I mean, I, I remember there was this guy who used to joke, mm. you know, I could walk into anywhere and people would be like, Munya, and then they would give me drinks, they would give me a place to stay, they would, you know what I mean? And so it makes all these bad habits worse, you know, yeah. But they start before. Okay, wow. Uh, let's talk more about your um, addiction stage. When did you realize, you said you didn't know. So when did you realize you're an addict? So uh, thank you for that question, um, Carol. Uh, so I was saved by a 12-step program um, and it, it completely changed my life. So, so what happened for me was I started drinking very early, like 13, 13 and a half, 14. And I, at the time I used to do it, you know, to, to, to be cool, you know, to fit in. And yeah. I didn't realize that I did it because I was so scared of who I really was and I was in pain and I was constantly trying to hide who I was. And, you know, I was drinking for all the wrong reasons. So, what made me, so that's when the career, drinking career started and I drank for about 15, 17 years. I started smoking at about 15 as well and you know, on and off. But when I left school, that's when it got serious. 
Um, so I managed to give all of that up. But I only realized that I had a problem after I encountered the, this 12-step program that saved my life. And once I, because it changed my, my entire life and it's only by the grace of God that I found this thing, you know, and that I was chosen to be sober because, you know, it's, it's, it is a gift. There's some people who are still suffering to this day and who don't know how to get out. And then there's some people who know how to get out, but they still, they can't do it. Because addiction, or alcohol, my addiction was alcohol primarily. It's a disease. It's a physical, mental, and a spiritual disease. So it's just like a flu. You know, when you have a flu, um, it, it's a, you have to take certain things so that the disease, to, 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 you know, to fight the symptoms or to, you know, but the disease itself doesn't go away. Like when you have a flu, you can't cure the virus. You can only tackle the symptoms, but it lives in your body. So you have to constantly live to tackle these symptoms. really excited to have Munya here today. It just goes to show us that it's not about who you are, how famous you are. Anybody can fall into this trap of alcohol or drug abuse. So how did this affect your family? Ooh, hey, that's a big one. You know, I think I'm so blessed to have the wife that I have, you know, and I cannot thank God enough that she stayed and she tolerated me through that time and she stuck by me, you know? My family is very close, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate that I, I come from a, a very supportive family, you know, my mom and dad, my brothers, and, but it did really affect my family and, you know, it's only when you stop and you see what's going on that you notice how bad it, affect, it affected my family. Um, Actually, you know, one of the things I remember, one of the things that led to me realizing I needed to stop was, I remember there was a morning that I woke up um, completely naked in my house on the couch, and my son was sitting next to me, Fumai, the oldest, I think, yeah, you remember, you remember him, <laughs> yeah, Fumai was, I think at the time he must have been about, it's about four years ago, so he must have been about uh, eight about seven or eight and he was just sitting there watching his cartoons and when I woke up I was like oh what's going on and you know it's because I'd been drinking the night before he was like no daddy I just wanted to sit next to you to protect you and it broke my heart I was like no you know what this this isn't right I can't have my child seeing me like this I don't know if you'll remember that um so it really did affect them and you know I was just at the brink of losing my family I mean the, the day that I I remember the day that, so there, there's stages of, of, alcohol, of, of, of alcoholism where, maybe not alcoholism, um, of drinking, where there's a stage called wet brain, where your brain starts to fall apart, you start to lose your mind and you know. So I was just on the brink, I was starting to see things and hear things and at the time, I my maple, you know. But now that I'm sober, I actually have an explanation for my maple, but that's a story for... We'll yeah, another day. <laughs> we'll yeah. get to that, you know, but it was really affecting them. And I remember my wife had lost control of me that night and she had to call my dad and my dad came and I was fighting my dad. And, you know, and even in all of that madness, I remember the look on my father's face because I'm a man now mm. and he can't restrain me. He's much yeah. older and, you know, and it was just disappointment but more not, not not so much disappointment it was um you know when you're when you know when you're finished when you you you're helpless you're hopeless so you're helpless to help somebody else and that feeling as a father is the worst feeling in the world where you can't help your son you can't protect him you can't and i saw that look on his face so it did affect him and you know this is why i always thank god i i i I remember the next day just crying out to God, saying, God, I, I can't live like this. I can't do this. Because I was just on the brink of about, to, I was just about to lose my wife and my kids. Uh, we were just about to, you know, it was causing relationship problems. So, yeah, it did, it did affect them in a negative way. Yeah, uh, very heartbreaking, I must say. I always say that um, substance abuse does not only affect yourself. It also affects your family, your community, and all that. Talking about that, 
how did it affect your future plans? You, you were doing great, you, you've got things happening around you, great wife, great family and all the fame. How did that affect your, your future plans, your finances as well? The worst thing about being an addict and, and an, well, an alcoholic um, is that, an, sorry, an active alcoholic, I have to get these terms correct, okay. is that it robs you of reality. So you live in a world that's not real. So you have all these people around you that aren't your friends, that don't wish the best for you, and it affects everything. You know, um, people have this thing where they say, no, we can go and we can discuss business when we're drinking. It's nonsense. There's nothing productive that comes from a business meeting where people are drinking or drunk. Maybe you're not drinking, but if you're drunk, you know, Contracts are signed when you're sober. That's that's just a fact. You know what I mean? It's not, the, and that's the norm. It's exceptional. It's 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 abnormal if you find you're signing more contracts when you're drunk. So it affected my money, but I didn't realize it. So it, it robbed me of my reality. So because I didn't realize, I thought ah, everything's fine. You know, we're doing really well. We're making films and all that. And I lost out. I missed out on so many opportunities. There's so many meetings where I didn't make it to the meeting because I was drunk the night before and I woke up drunk. One, there's so many things that, there's so many people that wanted to work with me that, you know, because, because you know, you've got this, I've got this disease of alcoholism, it affected my drink, it affected my moods. So I was always angry, I was always fighting with people, you know, so there's so many people I pushed away with my behavior. So it did affect quite a lot. Um, it did, um, also introduce me to a lot of people. So it's, it's, it's again, it's a double-edged sword. You meet a lot of people. So if you're able to navigate the darkness and all that, you can bring out positive things, but it's usually more negative. I, I, don't, I don't think anything positive comes out of any addiction at all. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I stand guided, you know, I'm not, I don't know everything. All I know is my experience, you know, yeah. Wow. Um, I just want to find out what, what got you into into substance abuse because you had it all happening. You know, you've got, I mean, everything. We all love to have a child like Munya. You know, everybody looked up to you, the country itself, our young people and stuff like that. What stressed you to the extent of wanting to rely on a substance? So what I always say is that I have a mind that cannot process reality and a body that cannot handle alcohol. Alcoholism is a threefold disease. It affects your physical, your phys, it affects you physically, mentally, and spiritually. So physically, my body couldn't handle the drink. Um, mentally, my thought process, I used to be very paranoid, very scared, and I didn't know how to deal with reality. I didn't know how to deal with all these other problems. And because of that, it affected my, it started to affect my spirit. So I, I kept having these negative emotions that eventually started to affect my spirit. So you start carrying these things around. So it wasn't so much the stress of the environment or the world around me. It wasn't triggered by stress or trauma or anything. It was just triggered by, it, it's actually a disease that I was, I was born with. I mean, it's, it's something that's in me that I have to figure out how to, to constantly manage, you know, and you know, like I mentioned, the 12 step program helped me realize what was wrong with me. And what was wrong with me was those three things. You know, so I had to figure out a, a new way of life that helps me manage these things in such a way that it doesn't lead me to the bottle. You know, the bottle was a painkiller. You know, so if I had had a, because everyone has got pain, life is hard for everyone. Mm. You know, whether you're Munya Chidzonga, the famous person, or anyone on the streets or anyone who's in a position of power, a politician, a judge, whatever. Life is hard and it's relative. But what you need to have are the tools to deal with that, emo that, that difficulty of life. If you don't have those, if you have the wrong tools or the wrong solutions to your pain, you end up like me and you start to use alcohol and drugs, etc. Mm. Yeah. So that's how. Um, you did also mention that um you started drinking at 13. <laughs> That's pretty young. Um, do you think that could be a contribution also of you maybe not have, being able to handle yourself as you were growing with alcohol? 
I think I think so. I mean, you know, but again, you need to look at the. I think we need to examine the the, the what led up to, um, to 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 having that drink. You know, in in, 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 in in the program that that, that we that we practice, we speak about uh, what we call. There's all these acronyms acronyms that we use. One is bud, build up to drinking, and the other thing is we say that we are powerless. You know, one drink is 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 too many and a thousand drinks is not enough. But it's about the build up to that first drink. So for me, I drank because I was insecure. I was scared. And you know, when I got to high school, I was so scared of just being there. And I realized that what could protect me was girls and being the bad boy. So if there was a crowd of people, I used to misbehave to try and fit in. So that first drink came from a place of fear as opposed to, oh, let's have fun or because I was so insecure. So I was looking for something to hide this pain of insecurity and loneliness and sadness and just I couldn't process my world normally because normal children at that age, you know, with that pain, if you have that pain, you process it or you hand it over, you deal with it, you speak to someone or you play sport or you do something. Yes. But abnormal people like myself, who then become addicts, you deal with it by taking something, altering your mind, altering your reality. Did your parents know? Um, I think they, so my parents had a very interesting philosophy. So they, when we got older, they, they about 15, 16, they used to keep booze in the house. And they said, look, if you're gonna drink, drink around us. Because we don't want you to, to you know to to be to be surprised or shocked or, or too taken by this thing you know mm -hmm. that was their philosophy they didn't know that i started drinking at 30. okay you know that was misbehavior mm -hmm. i hear you yeah and again my friends thought it was cool and i at my first cigarette i did the same thing i thought this will make me look cool and in a crowd of people i can be that kid who's smoking oh it's so cool and then it led to addiction. But the root wasn't the actual alcohol itself. The root was the fact that I wasn't able to process my feelings of insecurity and insignificance. Yeah. Wow, that's a very interesting. Um, just thinking, what advice would you give to parents with regards to uh, their children in school? You're talking about insecurity, being scared. But I'm sure your parents thought you had it all happening. You were in a very good school and um, probably had all the food you needed in the house. What more did you want? Um, can you just explain that? How would they have done better, maybe for you not to feel the way you felt? Because I'm sure they felt they were doing all that they could. Yeah, that's a, that's a very hard one, eh? And, you know, I'm a, I'm a parent now. <laughs> yes, and your son almost a teenager. <laughs> yeah, he's going to form one next year. Yes. <laughs> Hey, it's um, that's a hard one because according to the program, you 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 have to allow somebody to hit rock bottom. Okay. They have to want to be helped. Okay. So the honest truth is, you know, Carol, there's absolutely nothing you can do. If somebody is an addict, if somebody is born with that disease, they're born with it. The only thing that you can then do is to then create the sort of environment where they know that they have solutions. I think the best thing to do as a parent is to just create that environment where they know that there's a way out. Because I think what led me to drink even harder is that I didn't know about this program. I only discovered it much later. And I discovered it through, ironically, through my older brother who was in the States, who went through the same program. He went into rehab as well. Um, and if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have known about it, you know. Um, so I think creating an environment where, and you know, it, it, particularly in black communities, we don't, first of all, the parents need to educate themselves on solutions. You know, uh, finding out about rehabs like Mandipa Hope, you know, what programs do they offer, what is it all about, what is addiction. They need to be aware of these things and then you know, finding out about other programs that help people with addiction, you know. Um, there's a whole number of them, the 12-step program, and it's administered by various organizations, you know. Um, so I think equipping yourself with those tools, um, 
and letting the child know that there are options. You are not alone. If you have certain problems, you don't have to tell us, but there is a solution. But to be honest, there's no way of preventing it. You know, if, if somebody, if that's what they are, that's what they are. Well, that's interesting. I think from what I've just gathered from Munya, it's not about parenting skills or, yes, here and there, but from him, it doesn't look like he feels he comes from a background where he didn't get the uh, parental support. It just happened. Um, Munya Chizonga, I just want to thank you so much for coming on this show today. We could talk about this topic forever, but due to time, I've got to let you go. Uh, and to our viewers, um, it's been great talking to Munya and I hope you learned one or two things. Uh, we hope to be bringing more people on this show so that they can share their experiences with regards to substance and alcohol abuse. Uh, for today, I just want to say thank you and goodbye. This program was made possible by Mandipa Hope Rehabilitation Center. Giving you hope, giving you sleep.